Okay, it's working so far. Woohoo! Amazing. Okay, so yeah, we're going. We're live. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, uh, there might be a little bit of figuring out here. Uh, I hope that's okay with everybody. Uh, I'm not very familiar with with the with hosting Zoom. That's my first time. So, um, the first thing I would ask maybe is. Uh, Can I see some people? Because <laughs> I don't see anybody right now. Ah, there we are. Good morning. Good Suprabhat. Ah, very nice. So good to see you all. Oh, Marty is in the dark. Okay. You're not afraid of the darkness, Marty. Good. So, okay, great, wonderful. Well, it's so nice to see you, everybody. Wait, who's, who's here? Oh, Maxwell, okay, good. Hi, it's Maxwell and Katrin together. Good, okay, great, yes, because I see you both in one screen and then I have you on another one, so. Yeah, I'm logged in on my phone, too. <laughs> great, just, just making sure. <laughs> great. Good to be here. Ah, wonderful. Well, uh, for one thing, I just want to mention that I'm pretty thrilled that this is even working. Um, this is a complete test, so uh, I think we have, a, we have a thumbs up for our first session so far. Great. Well, it's great to see you all. And uh, Okay, I hope I didn't leave anybody behind. No, I think I'm good. Um, so welcome to Sri Lanka. Uh, I think maybe uh, I'll share my my little bit my vision about this. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, that's the f the other question. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Awesome. <laughs> We're not seeing Akansha, but she's giving thumbs up. And um, yeah, so my idea behind this is um, maybe to um, have some kind of magic internet portal so that you can come to our monastery in Sri Lanka and experience a little bit of, um, of our time here and how it, how it is when people come and visit us and asking the monks questions about meditation and uh, we have some people coming already from our community in Sri Lanka sometimes and this is where we kind of have discussions and talk about well Kokila is here Kokila is one of them so <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I am being warned that my internet connection is unstable so uh, <laughs> <laughs> bear with me and so uh, yeah so using the magic portal of the internet uh, to bring you all in the monastery and uh, have a nice time together I invite you all to uh, turn on your microphones and ask whatever questions you'd like to ask uh, we can do a little bit of life catching up if you like. This is a very informal session, just you and I and Naveen. The tech, the tech crew is behind. You can't see him, but he's there. <laughs> so maybe, um, yeah, that's, that's a bit how it is right now. Um, yeah, weather has been uh, kind of up and down here in Sri Lanka. Very hard to predict. We're in between two, um, the two seasons. There's two main seasons in Sri Lanka and we're right in the middle, in the north and in the south. So we get rain all the time. <laughs> the, the rainy season in the north and in the south are opposite, but we're right in the middle. So 
right now we're kind of I had to move a little bit further from the railing because uh, I would be a wet monk and um, yeah so how's everybody doing Kokila Kokila's got a green Doing good. Doing good. Ah, very nice. Okoma Hondaida. Okoma Hondaida. Ah. As you said, you know, intermittent rain and showers even in Colombo. Mm. Yeah, weather gets hot and cold, but everything is fine. Ah, yes. Naveen was saying there is a lot of rain in Colombo now. Yes. Yeah, yes. we're getting that too. Not continuously. Ah, yes. Satu tingin na wa de? Satu tingin na wa, hondingin na wa. Hondingin na wa. Doing good. Doing good. Bawa na karan na de? Bawa na karan na koho ma de? Bawa na karan na wa. Ah. Bawa na karan na wa. Ah. Hema da ma de? Oh, hema da ma. Ah. So I just ask uh, Kokila, how is it going? If, is she happy? And uh, is she meditating? And she said, yes, she's meditating every day. Hemadama. Just so we get the translation for everybody. Piku, where do you live? Hello, Bante. How are you? Hello. <laughs> I, am I live in India. India. In what part of India? Uh, do you know Chandigarh? Chandigarh. Ah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Ah, near Chandigarh. Uh, I live in Mohali. Ah, near Chandigarh. very nice. Very nice. Well, it's good to have you. I'm so happy to see you. Ah, yes. Time. Yes. It's a uh, first meeting. I haven't done a retreat with you yet. Yes. Hopefully soon that can help. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to be careful because um, it's, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of... Um, I've realized this year that the retreats have been taking pretty much all my time and uh, I need to be careful of uh, how much how much I do that because uh, it's uh, I don't know how it looks on the outside but <laughs> on the inside it's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on like every retreat has a lot of things going on and it starts six, seven months before the retreat and it's going, going, going. So, um, yeah. So everybody's awakened? No, no questions? That's great. <laughs> oh, Naveen's here. It's not recording because questions cannot be recorded here. So, ah. recording, then we can get the question part and copy yes. it together. Uh, is it okay with everybody if we record uh, this conversation or would you prefer not recorded? Yeah. So yeah, it's okay? Recorded. Okay. Good. Okay, so Naveen says we should record. Uh, record. Okay. Recording in progress. She said it's going on. Okay, so. Et bonjour. Ah? Huh? Ah, hello, Marty. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. It's still quite early in the morning here, and it's about three degrees. <laughs> <laughs> the joys of um, Canada. I'm, I'm sitting in the truck. So nice. I wake up Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it looks uh, it looks beautiful there where you are. I do have a question, Bundy. Great. Can you please uh, explain investigation as one of the seven factors, please? Mm. If I can explain investigation. <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny one. Yeah, so in Pali is Dhamma Vichaya. Dhamma Vichaya is... Um, I liked what... Um, uh, 
Prashant. Prashant, my first, my first teacher in that, in the Twim tradition. He was, uh, he was saying curiosity, and I really like that, curiosity and dhamma. So it's kind of like that thing that is driving you to inquire about the state of your mind. Um, I see it as right effort also. That's where right effort is, I think. So we start, we have, we need some, some level of awareness. So sati, first, first level, not first level, but first factor of awakening. Then with that awareness, whether we're practicing some kind of wholesome state like metta that is kind of coming with that, or feeling the sensation with the body with a smile, because it has to be uplifted. Um, then we have a little bit of awareness. We have a little bit of presence. I like that presence of mind also. And with that, we don't kind of sit idle. We, whenever, whenever there's distractions coming into the mind, we're kind of, we're noticing that. We're noticing that distractions come with tension, Four Noble Truths. And we actually see that our mind is agitated, it's thinking about that story. That is investigation. We let it go. That is investigation. Right effort. So investigation is kind of a big, I would say it's like the engine of, of the seven factors of awakening. Because right effort is really interesting. It has two components. It has what we need to do, which is like abandoning unwholesome states, bringing up wholesome states. But that's one side of right effort. The other side of right effort is to do that continuously. And so, wiriyang arabati chiktang paganhati padahati. I think that's the Pali. So you do that all the time, you practice continuously. So right effort is not just abandoning one hindrance or one distraction. It's doing it over and over and over and over. And so that's why retreats are amazing because we have that time, we have that momentum to build. And so, and the third factor of awakening is virya. And so that's, see how Right effort is kind of like part of both of these. So the first one, investigation, we kind of pay attention to what's going on in the mind, feel the tension when it comes, release, relax, smile. And then, virya is like that um, perseverance or like that continually practicing that. So it's, right effort is like in those two steps, investigation and doing that continuously. I like to call that devotion. Because in Buddhism, there's... Nowadays, there's... I just love that word. I love the word devotion, and I think it's missing. So, <laughs> that's where I put it. Um, and, yeah, because I think it's, a, it's not about energy or effort. It's about how devoted we are to our practice. To, to loving kindness, to compassion, to helping. It's how devoted we are to these beautiful states and actions. So for me, yeah, so investigation is hmm, really that place where we kind of, um, we, we use right effort and we cultivate wholesome states and abandon the unskillful ones. Bhante, yes. you teach that um, we get rolling with that so that we, we just let the um, investigation go so that we 
when anything comes up, we don't look at it. We just let it go. We're just on uh, release, 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 always on let go. So are you saying that at some point the investigation falls away and you don't need it anymore so that we're not always stopping to have a look? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we're, yes, exactly. Uh, but Marty, you know everything that I'm saying, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> something to look at it if I if I listen to another talk on Vipassana then I'm always struck by how much that practice requires I thinking and investigation and so that's why I'm curious because in our practice it seems that investigation like even when there's things are very quiet and there's a feeling of something coming up, even before you look at it, uh, you already let it go. Okay, it's not important, whatever it's going to be. And it seems very in opposition somehow to what I hear with Vipassana. And I know that the practice that you teach is both Vipassana and Samatha together. So I'm trying to understand which part of Vipassana, or maybe I just don't understand Vipassana, Bhante. Mm -hmm. Can you help them with that? Yeah, Vipassana is very complicated. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, that's, I think Vipassana has been made complicated. Uh, but I don't think it is. Um, actually, to be honest, if you really want to attain Nibbana, and I don't mean like, this is just a, a common thing that we say, he, like especially in Sri Lanka, you know, we just like, go, go for Nibbana, you know, like the real, the real, the real Buddhist <laughs> and gold kind of thing. Um, if you want to, if you want to under like attain nibbana or the realization of the Buddha, it can be complicated. Actually, that's what I'm realizing more and more. Is the more complicated it is, the more I don't know, the more misleading it is because. So vipassana. First of all, the Buddha didn't talk about it that much, to be honest. It came a lot more after. Um, if you look in the suttas and you try to find the word vipassana, I give a talk in Costa Rica. The last talk of the retreat was about samatha vipassana, and I had some uh, some sutta references. It doesn't come up very often, and uh, the Buddha uses it in a sequence, in a sandhi construct in Pali. It's um, Adi Panya Dhamma Vipassanaya. And that means with the higher wisdom or the wisdom of mental states, one, uh, one understands their, their minds, the, the Dhamma. The Dhammas are like the mental states in the mind with, with clarity, with Vipassana, seeing clearly. For me, for me, Vipassana is really all about understanding not just when you have a distraction, for example. It's good to understand. It's good to not, not just let it go and like wipe it off kind of thing. Because you can just relax it, relax it in your body and yeah, sure, that's, that's great. But also I found that it's mostly about understanding, continuously understanding, deepening our understanding of how, like, what it is that arose. First noble truth, what is its cause? There is an attachment. 
<laughs> a third, okay, when I understand these two things, it's unpleasant. There's an attachment. What am I attached to? Ah, that's what it is. If I let it go, things get better. And then, fourth, keep practicing that whole thing. So for me, Vipassana is all about the Four Noble Truths with regards to mental states. So, um, for me, for example, like... I notice like a restlessness sometimes, like, and I don't mean, um, how can I say, like I'll turn off my light, I'll go, I'll, I'll go for um, food, for example, it's time to go for food, I've meditated all morning, and then uh, sometimes some things happen, and then I'm not thinking, I'm not there anymore, I'm just thinking of, oh, this and that have to do, and then I'm turning off my light, for example. And then I notice, oh, I wasn't actually there when I turned off my light. Or I did something, I took my bag and I walked out and I noticed later, I'm like, oh, I'm not there. I'm actually not here. And this is kind of sneaky. It's, uh, it's one of those... And I like, to, I like to stop there, for, for me, that's what I do. Um, I like to stop and think about, ah, what was I holding on there? Because there was something in my mind that I was, I was thinking about what I have to do and what needs to be, to, I have to call that person for this retreat and I have to write to them and ask about, you know, cooking and all that. And, and then, oh, but... <laughs> Guess what? I'm not here now. So my attachment is, is very wholesome. It's a very wholesome thing. It's about, you know, beautiful event in the future or whatever it is. But it's taking my mindfulness. And it also comes with tension. And when I... There's a way that I can do this. There's a way that I can... There's a way and a time to do that properly. Like let that process go like oh yeah I need to write to this person like that that thought is not unwholesome <laughs> that's okay you, you can write to your friends or you can write to you know your family and that's all good the thing is that sometimes there's too much of it or something else is happening at the same time which is kind of putting you off balance and um, so I think for me Vipassana is, I mean of course it's a big topic, but uh, it all comes down for me to understanding how we create ourselves uh, problems with, with our own minds, with our own mental attitude sometimes. And we can, I think, Depending on the practitioners, some people will have more of vipassana inclination and some people will have a more samatha inclination. Even within that same practice that we're all practicing here, uh, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, when you see a distraction arising, the tension in the mind, some people, it's really easy for them. They have like samatha inclined. They just like, whoo, they just let it go, relax, and it's all gone. It's all placid, perfect. But some people need more, a little bit more of a like, they can do that, but then it comes back. And then that means it wasn't done, it wasn't understood. You, we, we might have swept it away. But if it comes back over and over again, maybe it's good to see it like, hey, what is that? Maybe, maybe I'm kind of like rushing things right now. Like, what is that that's coming over and over again? Ah, oh, it's that thing. It's that, I don't know, it's that lie I said, or it's that, or, that, or like that little tiny thing, or it can be whatever it is. Um, and then... I find that once we stop and really understand what it is, the, the cause of it, where it comes from, 
and how it's actually impeding us in our happiness actually when we do that really well when we understood we un when we understand that really well it's easier to let it go because the mind is like you know what that's okay i'm i'm done now i i'm okay i want some calm mental peace so that's what i would say vipassana i i mean i can go on i can give a four-hour talk on Nanicha Dukkha Anatta if you like but I think maybe uh, maybe another day <laughs> yes Avinash how are you great great ah. we did uh, our retreat in Yavadmada oh very good yeah how was it Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean? Oh, you you meant the we, the we one did. we had? Yes, yes. That was yeah, like yeah. Uh, two years ago now, huh? Yes. Amazing. That yeah. Was great, great yes. Great. Yeah, that was a nice retreat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I I have a question, uh, Yes. Uh, like first time I re uh, hear about the one one one. Uh, the Sariputna's experience. So I uh, very much delighted. Wow, this is a whole path. This is the eight jhana, and like uh, uh, one time came, the mind don't move, and all will be great after that. Uh, but that sutta provide, I mean, lot of information about the each of each jhana, how it's occur in each. So sometimes I meditate. So, like, uh, I always try to like. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm there in fourth. I mean, there in third jhana, first jhana. So, uh, is is this a distraction, like, sir? Uh, uh, not necessarily, unless you're overthinking it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, one, one more question. So, uh, the experience uh, uh, described in each jhana is very, like, seem, seems like very intense. So, uh, infinite space is like, I mean, you are in the, like, uh, Grand Canyon and <laughs> you get all that and then the next one is uh, infinite consciousness is like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, uh, it seem intense. But it's have to be that intense, or uh, like you just you're happy and then be calm and more calm and more calm. That's enough. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I think. <laughs> like, yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, I the 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 thing I recommend the most usually is um, as long as you're having fun <laughs> as long as you're enjoying your sit it sounds ridiculous like people laugh all the time when I say that but <laughs> and actually <laughs> it's it's my number one advice to like the best like meditators or like the most seasoned meditators uh, it's a very common thing that people start to try to overdo it and they lose the joy. They lose the they lose that. And I I and that's when I keep telling them joy is like the leading horse. It's at the front. And the leading horse as long as the leading horse is at the front, you're okay. Whatever is going to happen, you can just continue your meditation and you, you know that you're going to get there. But when the joy falls away, then all the horses start to kind of, ah, let's go check out this place and check out this other place. And, and then the question comes and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, like, what's, what's this meditation? Like, I don't, I don't feel any progress or... 
the thing is, the joy has dropped, and now the horses, they, don't, they go all over the place. And so it's something that even happens later. And I would say, because um, what you're describing, like trying to understand each of the jhanas and things like that, there's a way in which that happens naturally. If you meditate, uh, you will become aware of each, of each level of meditation. Because that's, that's just the meditation. The meditation will kind of bring you there. It, that is your choice. If you want to investigate more, oh, like this is interesting. Like, oh, this is, you know, oh, okay, like I understand. Like lightly, just like kind of from the background. Uh, you can kind of like be like, oh, this is interesting. And as long as you just keep smiling, just keep enjoying your meditation, the joy will really make your mind sharp and it will make you go through the whole thing. So, of course, with the letting go and the relaxing, both, both together are like two hands, you know, they're just like washing each other. So, um, and then at some point, what usually happens is that because you're so used to experiencing these levels of meditation, the mind starts to, it, it knows them very well and it, it loses interest, basically. It loses interest in knowing even being aware of like, oh, this is this or this is that. It just, all it wants is just, just get me out of here. Like, just, just, just relax, 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 relax. Just, I don't want to, mind doesn't want to cling to a specific experience anymore. Even jhana. So, I would say it's useful to know all of them. Of course, it's like a role map. It's really useful to know what the mind is doing. But then it's not to be overemphasized as later in the mind, later in the meditation, even paying attention to which jhana someone is in will just seem too heavy, too heavy for the mind. It would like, a, like adding a burden on, on something that you're trying to get rid of. So you're just like, uh, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Where are you, Avinash? Where are you hailing from? I'm, 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 I'm from Pune. Pune. Ah, that's what I thought. Yes. Ah. Tumhi ke se ya hat. Kup chan, kup chan hai, kup chan hai. Good. Bhante, can I uh, ask uh, one, one more question? Of course, of course, uh, we're here for that. <laughs> uh, like uh, in Anapanasati uh, Sutta, uh, there is a relaxation step. So, uh, in my meditation, uh, I find I use that step uh, like very frequently. I find uh, very useful like uh, some tension in the leg and I can relax it. So I find my mind become calmer and more deeper. Mm. So uh, is this fine or it's a cheating? Or <laughs> it's like not uh, aligned with uh, what Buddha... Uh, okay. No, I, I mean, whatever is said in the Anapanasati is said by the Buddha. So can't really... <laughs> can't really argue here so and that's where Bhante Vimala Ramsey took the relaxed step from so in all honesty that's that's where it comes from and um, that's that's great I think I think the Anapanasati is just a very practical tangible down-to-earth way that the Buddha explained really what to do step by step kind of thing and uh, we don't find that kind of teaching that in that many other places in the suttas. And I, 
personally I call it the toolbox of meditation you can you can just use uh, whatever tool you need at the specific moment you know sometimes you need a bit more joy you need to put a bit more joy and then sometimes you need to calm down a little bit more then you just calm down a bit more just spend more time with the bodily sensation just stimulate that vagus nerve just like ah okay yeah that's just like kind of whew, tone down a bit sometimes I feel it in my meditation it's like my whole nervous system just goes like boom you know like at some point <laughs> was it the joy or was it the relaxing they work together they're just really so I would say all good you're doing good <laughs> very good good smiles uh -huh. Smriti Asya Sm ah, good yes Piku Ah, can't hear. Um, um, one thing I wanted to ask if equanimity is, is an emotion. Sorry? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think that equanimity is also an emotion? Ah, equanimity. Hmm. The, the way that I... Hmm. The way that I understand equanimity, upekka, I like to call it mental steadiness or blissful poise, depending on the, the context. And for me, equanimity in the terms that the, in terms of the Buddha and his teaching, is not just equanimity like somebody shouts names at me and I, I manage to maintain my composure. That's not what I think is equanimity like, um, like forced equanimity, like some, some, something really intense happens to me and I can endure it. We could say, some people say this is equanimity, but for me equanimity is what happens to the mind when we cultivate the seven factors of awakening and the mind kind of becomes very polished and very clear and very calm and steady so it's that calm steady presence first we have that awareness we investigate the Dhamma and then we we bring up joy and loving-kindness, compassion, which are very emo like what we call emotional states uh, sometimes in the West or well everywhere um, and once the mind gets purified with that with relaxing also doing that over and over again this is really uh, the doing that with devotion and then there is joy arising see that joy that more kind of emotionally charged experience that that we can have but that that joy is a very special joy because it comes from mental development and so this is quite quite special in itself and then there is collectedness tranquility and steadiness and so upeka is like steadiness or equanimity whatever we want to call it for me, Upeka is like the culmination of all seven factors of awakening together, which kind of mature in that beautiful, steady presence of mind. And we could call it an emotional state because it is imbued with previous practice of loving kindness, compassion, joy. This is kind of how we get there. And then the mind gets purified. The Buddha explains that in many suttas, actually, very clearly. It's one of the most common instructions to uh, his lay practitioners to gladden the mind, to bring up joy, to remember the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, the virtue, 
anything that uplifts your mind, that clears it, that cleans it. Loving kindness. And then the mind, he said, becomes, reaches that upekka. And then, depending on how you experience that, and depending on our definition here of emotional, uh, personally, I would, I would say it's, it's an emotional state. It's a very beautiful, polished, mature emotional state. That's, I th that's what I think it is. Um, I was saying, so we do experience joy when we're retreating equanimity. There is joy. So. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's why I like to say that joy, piti, that it never, it never, it never goes away completely. Actually, um, it matures. Yes. It goes from being more excited to more like a vaster, more steady joy that is more like, more like really deeply fulfilling sensation rather than just surface bubbles, I guess. Um, and then that culminates into upeka and the the event I like to relate to 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 kind of prove my uh, my theory on on this is that uh, when the Buddha when the Buddha awoke he um, he spent seven days uh, in one posture enjoying the bliss of freedom under the Bodhi tree and then he stood up changed trees and did it again for another seven days, enjoy the bliss of freedom. And he did that seven times. And so, <laughs> I mean, it's got to be good. <laughs> That's what I like to remind people. <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, oftentimes I experience this when I'm uh, experiencing jhana and jhanic state. Then what happens with me is that I start to six out it, mm -hmm. and then I realize it probably after my meditation is done. I thought I thought that I'm doing it right, but in the moment I'm not able to see it that I'm doing it. Right. Like, uh, when, I, when I start to experience some joy or more blissful state, I try to bring myself uh, to the object of meditation. Try to kind of not see what's happening, whether mm -hmm. it's infinite space or different jhanic state. And oftentimes I realize that I think I'm doing it wrong, maybe. Or mm -hmm. should I just observe the jhanic state, like sit down there and see what's happening? Or should I just try to be, put it like, put aside and go back to the object of meditation? Some kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't need to worry too much about what jhana or what level or what to do. It's the same recipe the whole time. So you keep doing the six hours, for example, with the object of meditation that you're in. And you keep smiling and that's all you need to do. The rest will happen on its own. Uh, the less you get involved, because when you try to do it, when you try to get involved, the thing is, you're actually distracting yourself. So that's, that's the trick there. Is that like, uh, the jhanas are really interesting and often the mind is saying, oh, but you should be doing that. Because that's the, that's the thing nowadays, the mind, especially nowadays, always comes up with things to do. <laughs> when we're not doing something the mind goes like whoa like what's happening here like I, I, I should be doing something like I should be productive this is not productive like I should be investigating and that's those are really old sankharas from school from society um, they're really hard to break past that um, but meditation is the opposite. Actually, when the mind starts to try to do things in the meditation, just relax, just smile and laugh at, 
at, laugh at the mind and just be like, uh, oh, here, mind is going all over the place again, trying to, trying to control what I'm trying to let go of. <laughs> or trying to do something while I'm trying to relax. And so, actually meditation is very, very, very simple. It's all about relaxing, enjoying, feeling that beautiful state. Uh, are you with loving kindness? Uh, what, what is your vehicle? What are you cultivating? Um, I'm practicing loving kindness. Yes, okay. Is yes, okay, good. And then you stay with that and you, it'll, come, it'll calm down on its own. It will calm, calm down on its own. And you don't need to do much. At some point, the mind, it will naturally, it will feel like, ah, oh, uh, the loving kindness feels better and easier when it's more calm. And it just comes out naturally and it's easier. And you just keep smiling into that. And then at some point, the mind will become very collected and you just you just relax into that relax into that and keep keep enjoying keep enjoying <laughs> good it would be great to have a retreat together then i could i could know a little bit more about your meditation so i <laughs> i think i start to feel fear ah ah okay yes just relax, just enjoy. No big problem. Actually, it's very funny, like, sometimes it's like just a little perspective shift, like turning a coin, you know? It's like uh, the mind is thinking something and then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, it's just, oh, that's just the mind. It's just trying to understand something or like um, my, my favorite hindrance is doubt because I think that's a funny one because doubt is like you're wondering like oh am I doing it right am I doing it right I'm doing it wrong like I must be doing something wrong and actually what is wrong is the mind is thinking it is wrong that's the only thing that's wrong <laughs> So I think it's funny. <laughs> I think for me, it's like restlessness and doubt. Yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, these two. They're always coming very, very close. They're two friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. My pleasure. <laughs> Kokila. Mm. Yes, Pante, I'm here following and listening. Good. How are you? But, uh, good. Uh, I don't have a question. Good. Maybe next time. Yes, yes. I saw your microphone was on, so I thought you wanted to talk. Uh, okay. That's okay, no problem. I'm just, just checking. My video is off, so yes. I don't want to go back and adjust it now. Yeah, so no, no see. problem, no problem. Hello, Monte. Uh, Hello, Maxwell. I don't want to uh, change the topic too much, but um, I have a question, and I would like to little, know a little bit more about like your everyday life. Oh, what, my what a day it looks like for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, the sun rises, and uh, that's the beginning. <laughs> I mean, that's generally the the beginning of the day. Day, um, Eddie. Uh, yeah, I was actually wondering uh, the etymology of morning this morning. But uh, 
uh, I was wondering if it had something to do with the sun rising or anyways uh, slice of life what a day looks like for me well <laughs> days look like uh, very different depending on the place I am so well very different the yeah uh, here in Sri Lanka uh, Buddhist country uh, I live in the monastery so it's a very it's a very normal monastic setting where um, I wake up just uh, just before dawn and uh, Naveen, Naveen this time, Naveen is here, so that's great. Last time he wasn't, so every time Anicca. So this is Anicca Sanya. Also, life is meditation. Meditation is life. Things come, things go. Now, this time Naveen is here. He's helping me with uh, many, many, many things. One of them is making me chai in the morning, so that's very important. Uh, that's like uh, the golden holy grail of uh, my morning's meditation, uh, Naveen's chai. And then uh, I meditate all morning, so that's exciting uh, until, <laughs> until 11. So yeah, usually uh, here Davaldane uh, lunch, like the monastic lunch is usually we have to eat before noon, right? So we usually it's at 11. So we eat at 11 and there is food uh, at the monastery that is offered. Sometimes I go for alms round depending on where I am, but that's usually at the uh, at the sunrise. So uh, depending, but because of my recent B12 deficiency episode in India, which was quite uh, shocking for me, um, big experience, I'm uh, very careful with my health and I'm not going uh, pindapat, uh, I'm not going for alms right now because I'm trying to rebuild my health uh, completely and just making sure that I have all the little nutrients that I need. Um, as far as as much as possible and so um, right now yeah we go at 11 uh, have food at, at the monastery and usually people will come um, so the way that the monastery work is uh, we have someone that is a cook here he's a kind of residing cook and Often people will kind of either come and cook food with him to offer us or they'll offer like, uh, like an amount that covers what is needed for the day. And uh, it's a very kind of Sri Lankan traditional thing. Um, people will often go to monastery and say like, uh, oh, I want to offer uh, dana for that day. And then they have a calendar. And anyway, so today we have a big group uh, of people. Some days we have nobody. Most days we have nobody. Because <laughs> we're, we're pretty far out in the forest and that's kind of why I'm here too. So that's nice. Uh, seclusion is really good. And then um, after meal, then it depends. We do some... Uh, we usually go for a walk in the afternoon. I walk about two hours every day. Uh, so two, yeah, two to three hours here is very nice because uh, the, the monastery is right in the middle of a big uh, valley with the Knuckles mountain range and so this is like uh, very beautiful misty mountains in the heart of Sri Lanka and there's a lot of hiking to do so every day we're going for a good health walk keeping in shape um, because I found that also that really helped my meditation because when when we sit for very long when we do a lot of meditation we also need to activate the body um, because it it can be unwholesome <laughs> to just <laughs> to just sit for that long and so it's really good to actually go and get exercise and so I do that and we very lucky here we have a beautiful mountain river that runs down too so i go in the river and it's pretty cold water almost every day and um, 
whatever work needs to happen uh, during the afternoon, that's kind of when that happens. Um, either Sutta translations or Naveen is telling me I need to get working on my books so that we can print them in uh, before the end of Vasa. I'm not, I'm not sure this is going to happen, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the retreat organization, contacts, email. Now, Naveen has been jumping in and helping with tons of things like the website and everything. So it's been a lot of things like that happening. We're trying to organize the retreat for the coming retreat in Sri Lanka and all these things. And um, yeah. I like to, uh, and then sometimes, you know, in the evening, I'll, once a week, I'll call my mom. You know, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not beyond that, uh, that level. I'm, uh, I'm very, uh, uh, yeah, I, I call my, I try to stay in touch with my family a little bit uh, and do, yeah, like contacts and things like that. And um, and in the evening, then it's wrap up time. When the sun goes down, I like to kind of move away from any light or screens, and then go back to meditation. So that's kind of that's kind of my daily routine. Am I skipping something, Naveen? Oh, we have tea again in the afternoon. Uh, oh, okay. That's yeah. That's and, and how many how many monks are there at the how many monks are with you there? Uh, we're about four here at the at Sandha Narana, but there are um, nine nine other monks I think down at the other monastery very close to us. So these two monasteries here are very close and very uh, um, connected. So we uh, we often go down for uh, for food there, there too. They they've been established for longer than up here. So um, yeah. So in this whole sangha, we're about 13, 14 monks. There's a new monk. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Hillside Hermitage. Well, Hill, Hillside Hermitage was uh, is actually part of our monastery now. Uh, the Slovenian monks went back to Slovenia and uh, left us their monastery up there. And uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's what's happening here. Um, and then sometimes we have uh, Kokila and Ramani and uh, Priyanta and other people coming and visit, offering Dane, and then we have uh, chat here on the on my veranda this is kind of like where i live on my kuti so this is where we have the meditation interviews also on the retreat and uh, yeah yeah very That's interesting <laughs> because you, you know you always hear what you're what you're up to and then and i'm wondering like i wonder what it's like really, on the <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, my pleasure. Danke schön. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually American, but yeah. Ah, yes, okay, good. Thank I was. Yes, but you're in Germany now. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, ich bin Deutsch. Ah. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because our last retreat here. There was, uh, it was like the German retreat. There were seven people from Germany and they, nobody knew each other. They were just like all, all from Germany, just showed up. Yeah, it was really good. R great, really great group. So. Yeah, there's a monastery quite near here. Uh, ah. But yeah, we had a prison. Where are you in, the, in Germany? Um, near the Danish border. Ah, okay. Yeah. Nice. On the, on the North Sea. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> we, got two, we got the Baltic Sea and the North Sea right pretty close. Mm. Wonderful. 
Go can, for can I say something? Of course. Yeah, because I'm I'm so new to all of it. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm just finding out how to um, implement all those experiences mm -hmm. in my daily life. And that's why it was just a real nice question to hear or, or yeah, question to hear about your day and then you also have how I how I hear like social interactions. I like hearing that, and I liked in the beginning when you said um, that there's a lot going on inside. Um, like outside, it looks as if everything is very calm and very easy all the time, and that's where I'm at. It's like I'm I'm kind of in I'm kind of into what what. Um, yeah, I, I kind of know what I want, but it's so difficult to um, to learn that during normal life with um, two kids and three kids in total five, and then I'm, I'm working and um, just opening a, a yoga studio, and it's just so much going on, and it's just so interesting listening and just always hearing yeah just let it go just let it go <laughs> yeah but so i'm trying to cultivate patience uh -huh. and relaxation to i don't know come more into uh, the calm state of mind yeah <laughs> yeah great yeah. yeah thank you for for sharing that that's um yeah, you know, sometimes the thing that I the thing that I like to do in those situations when there is nothing really to do and Avinash you have a very cute kid. <laughs> yeah, she's my dog. Aww, that's so nice. Yeah. She will be uh one year next Aww, next year. congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, so the the thing that I like to uh to do when you know when there's when there's not when it seems that it's not much to do or like there's you're overloaded with so many things and what I really come back to and that's kind of I've been saying that a lot but I'll say it again is just awareness of the body and actually feeling feeling my body and is there like a way that I can relax? Like, whatever is happening, you can do everything that you need to do, and then and also like find a way to relax, like keep relaxing inside, and that will kind of keep you like fluid, keep you like flexible. Because in those moments, sometimes it's really challenging. Like, you feel like there's nothing you can do, or like, but you can always be with whatever happening and just like relaxing and. I'm a big fan of the, the vagus nerve and all of that whole understanding and I like to uh, I like to tap into that and like to, to tap into the, the power of feeling your body that that somatic kind of experiencing and and because just doing that you can feel that you might be busy outside but there is also a way to to be well inside while that happens so it's it makes it more present more loving uh, but yeah that's that's my two cents yeah yeah, yeah thank you I, I, that's that's why um why i see so much um um also that's why i'm doing it it's it's the the somatic experience for example is what what also um where I have a lot of experience with, and that's really nice, as mm. it helps me a lot. Mm. Um, I think I understand Piku a lot. The the doubt and the the fear, yeah, is is a lot in there. So I I experience some really nice stages, and that's why I why I stick to to practicing. Um, but there is a lot of something going on. What tells me. <laughs> that um, oh is this right or do I wanna or like there is a lot of ch chatting in my mind mm. um, 
Yeah, and I have to overcome that uh, very hard, yeah. Yeah. A big hindrance. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. yeah, it just needs time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So thank you for this opportunity here to listen ah. to you. And I mean, um, I'm doing your retreat online every once in a while, like meditating with you, and that really helps a lot. Yeah. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. mm. That's why I like to go in the river. Uh, really often I feel like it's a really good teacher. For, for me, the river has been teaching me a lot of things here. And, uh, well, not just here, but in general, a lot of rivers have been teaching me in my life. But uh, this, one, this one is teaching me about uh, <laughs> calm and tenderness and the flow of just... You know, li life is just a river, you know, like it, it, it's going down, you know, it's, it's, it's happening <laughs> whether we want it or not. <laughs> but there's a way to be graceful with it. There's a way to work with it. And there's a way to like paddle and understand its currents and where to paddle and where to save your energy and how to work with it, where to take a break when it's time to paddle, when it's time to slow down. Uh, so, and yeah, I just think it's, uh, it's a beautiful anal analogy for life. And there's, you know, you can't, you can't just, sometimes uh, we think s spiritual practices are about like, you know, really intense like breaking through everything and all that but actually i think it's more about understanding the natural the natural ways of life also and how how life flows and how, learning how to work with it and you know sometimes we'll we'll hit some rocks and sometimes we'll we'll make some mistakes but then we just you know uh that's the way it is and life keeps going so might as well keep paddling and keep keep swimming <laughs> with it <laughs> so yeah wonderful <laughs> hmm. beautiful well this is a this is a complete this is a complete test today we're just testing out the terrain of how are these sessions going to happen? How long they're going to happen for? Uh, you know, I'm welcoming all the feedback too. Was this a good time? Was this not a good time? Uh, for us, this is kind of the, a good time for, in terms of daylight and all that. But um, anyhow, welcome. We're welcoming any uh, any suggestion for future. Uh, I see that it's getting uh, it's getting bright in uh, Lake Superior. <laughs> Ante, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. It's very short. Do you remember when Goenkaji uh, mentions Banga? Mm -hmm. It very briefly, and I just wonder if you would say that what he's talking about is stream entry or seeing the dumb eye, the eye of the dumb. Is that what he means when he says that? Mm. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just uh, address what is Banga first and uh, Banga in the Goenka Vipassana tradition uh, is associated with uh, Banga is like the dissolution of all of, of the experience of the set of sensations in particular and I have to explain that in that particular tradition they they scan they practice feeling all the little sensations everywhere in your body and scanning your whole body up and down and down and up and up and down and down and up and at some point what happens is that it's kind of a it's kind of a, a forced awareness practice where awareness becomes so aware of these sensations at some point that it kind of breaks apart because awareness can kind of see through them I don't like 
if you've seen the matrix that's when neo goes into uh agent smith and then psh, you know the whole matrix is just like boom so that's banga and uh, is that stream entry and is that um it's a really good question and actually it, it came up a few times uh before so literally stream entry can be associated with understanding anicca so i would say that to to see that to experience that for oneself that dissolution of like that sensory fabric i would like of the body i mean at, at that level someone is also somewhat understanding that this is a ri <laughs> arising and passing away <laughs> And like Goenka would say it, like arising, passing, arising, passing, arising and passing. He puts a lot of emphasis on that. And there are some sutta references that the Buddha says when someone understands anicca that at that level, uh, this is kind of stream entry in some way. But the problem with stream entry is that it's a bit more than this. It's, uh, it, it, it really depends, you know. Someone could do that and not know much about anything about mental states, for example, which for me would disqualify. <laughs> uh, this <laughs> Stream entry disqualified. Uh, I think for me, stream entry means that one understands the Dhamma, at least, to a certain, to a certain level. And that means the nature of mental states, how they work, the impact that it has, and how to work with them. Uh, to the level where someone understands this is all conditioned. So whatever I've conditioned my mind to do in the past, um, then it, this is what is arising now. So. When we're having distractions and disturbances in meditation, it's not coming out from nowhere. <laughs> it's coming out from past conditionings that have been accumulated in our minds. And once we understand that process, we understand it's an impersonal process, anatta, then we cannot see it as a very as a personal thing. It's we see it as a very kind of a we see how it works and we see that it's conditioned so for me banga the dissolution of uh, sensory experience <laughs> i'm going to i want to be careful with what i say but uh, i think <laughs> I think does not necessarily qualify for stream entry. I think yeah, I, one, one needs more, more than just this. Because, because some people have experienced that and certainly are not settled in the Dhamma. They might have some faith, but it, it depends if someone is really settled in the Dhamma and understands the Dhamma. So that's really what it comes down to for me but it's a cool thing like I mean if you guys want to try it it's it's pretty cool matrix I have a follow-up question like I I know like people to work the people shut up because I like do some before. So, okay, uh, I mean, descriptively, uh, that Banga can be the, uh, like, infinite uh, consciousness, I mean, the experiences, uh, like, arising, passing away. So, uh, can, can it be that? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it really depends on what we mean by Banga because I, 
I would say the first problem that we will first of all get into is that um, here what do we mean by Banga because technically it's not in the suttas right so this is I I believe I believe this is Abhidhamma material and I've even tried to um, in my researches I tried to look up the subatomic particles that the that Goenka is talking about the Kalapas, yes, yes. Kalapas yes. I, I've actually searched the whole canon control F on the Vipassana Research Institute canon and uh, all the commentaries and sub commentaries the it comes up in a very very obscure sub commentary <laughs> it has one little mention there and it's so it's a um, it's very hard like so this is kind of like the buddha didn't really talk about this that's i guess my main point <laughs> and banga banga is like um is a term that is not really in the suttas so if we mean dissolution by banga then we could say yeah it could be um, each jhana is a dissolution of the previous jhana in some way it's a slow banga each each of the jhanas are a slow banga into nibanga <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want to know uh, your uh, thoughts on the uh, de determination uh, practice. Mm. Uh, when it's, it's recommended, or I mean, like, what, what, do, what do you think? Uh, mm. uh, yeah, per uh, personally. I don't recommend the termination practice uh, because because it goes against the grain of what we practice to my to my belief anyways um, for me it actually has been something I've needed to let go of uh, because they they have that has been my instruction from Bhante Vimalaramsi and I realized actually it was causing problems in my meditation um, because the thing is when you're trying to determine something you're trying to control your experience and for me everything that we're trying to do is to move away from that control that controlling mind and the problem is that some sometimes some teachers will teach determinations very way too early for one thing for one thing it will be way too early and cause big big problems in people's progress because first of all you need to be kind of wanting to determine that thing like oh I'm gonna enter this jhana for example but, but the problem is okay sure first of all I have to say I don't think the Buddha taught this <laughs> first of all I thought he I think he thought he taught a very natural progression through natural stages of meditation and we're not really supposed to mess with that that's what I think <laughs> we're not supposed to be saying like oh I'm gonna be here for five minutes and then I'm gonna be there for two minutes and then I'm gonna go back up there and for like two and a half seconds and then go back down this it doesn't for me that doesn't make any sense uh, I don't know first of all I don't know why anybody would want to do that uh, second um, I think those states are actually a natural progression that needs that just happens naturally faster or slower it doesn't actually matter there is no sutta reference that the Buddha talks about determinations like zero and um, if you want to attain cessation for example 
the best hindrance you can do for yourself is to try to attain it at a specific time with a specific amount of this or that. That's the number one thing that's going to keep you out of it. Um, and so, personally, yeah. And the other problem that I see with determinations is people start thinking that they're attaining certain jhanas really quick and coming back and going out and then it, and it's actually not creating a right um, how to say mind, mindset like a right attitude towards the practice uh, because then there's also I've seen competition arising out of this and I've also seen uh, which which is something that I completely discourage and I've also seen um, pride arising out of this a lot of pride <laughs> and delusion because people think that they attain some things but they don't actually it's just the mind is tricky and when you imagine that you're attaining some levels of meditation these levels are very subtle so when the mind is imagining that it is experiencing them I've had many people doing that and it's it's not necessarily badly intentioned but it's just the mind is finicky it's 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 really it's tricky and so it will make up these experiences and that's actually not giving you the true light of day for your own meditation practice that's what I think so I think it's doing you a disfavor in three ways but uh, you know that's that's me that's my personal opinion about it um, I just say enjoy your meditation don't worry about you know what jhana or things like that if you want to exactly know a bit more you can investigate you can see a little bit but this is a process that happens naturally the less we interfere with it the more we align with the Dhamma that's that's how I I see this so <laughs> Makes sense, very good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Beautiful. So, and how, uh, what's the time in Belgium? Il est quelle heure en Belgique? Now it is it's nearly two. Oh, very green to hear your voice again. Okay. Ah. With all this problem of communication. Yes. We also so to me that you are not very far from the inside in a story. Your oh. insights uh at mid age. Which uh, one? Ah yes, yes. Inside yes, yeah, you are part of them. So basically hillside is part of our monastery now. Uh, when they when they left, they gave their land to our monastery. So, well, this is hillside hermitage. Yes, yes. It was also be teaching also. Nearly the same, but we also the comparison how we uh, eat see the Dharma is also very and I just I thought about the <laughs> inside everything so mm -hmm. to see that just uh, on the side of your Yes. Degree. We walk there very often actually. It's uh it's on the way to uh it's a it's a beautiful walk and there's uh yeah, there's a, there's some nice cooties up there too. So, so is everybody satiated, full of the Dhamma? Okay, great. Well, it looks like uh, looks like it's time for action in Canada, 
and uh, and in other places. And uh, what time? Uh, oh, I guess if in Germany, if it's if it's two, three in Belgium, then it should not be too different in Germany. It's two. Okay, great. Well, maybe we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll end here unless there's more questions, but uh, I, think, I think that's a good time, an hour and a half, that's kind of usual. Great. And uh, yeah, please let us know uh, if there's anything else we could do or we could change or let us know your feedbacks and the idea is to do that uh, monthly. So I, for sure, I, I'll be able to commit to that, and I think that's that's already uh, that's already uh, nice. And you can keep writing your questions, or if you have anything you want to ask, we'll um, have yes, Piku. I I wanted to ask if we could do chanting in the beginning. Ah yes, like uh, what? Chanting, which one? Uh, ah, okay, good. Okay, sounds good. We can we can integrate a little bit of chanting. Beautiful, getting it even closer to the real monastery experience. In Bali or English? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> In Bali. <laughs> We can we can do both. Yeah, we can do. Both. Yeah, great. Well, that sounds that sounds good. Anything else? Great. Okay, yeah. So monthly, um, I think I am aiming um, for first thing like first Sunday of the month, something like that. I. Sometimes here, because of monastic things and unpredictable things, it's hard for me to really stick to an uh, exact schedule. But just to give you an idea, that's what's in my mind. Uh, every first Sunday of the month, I think, is going to be the goal. Like this one, I missed a little bit because I just got sick and I'm just newly recovered. And uh, there's a few things going on, but uh, just so you know. And uh, we'll see how that goes and open the internet portal once once in a while welcoming you all it's really nice to to share this time with you and Thank so you so thanks for thanks this opportunity to direct wonderful and maybe we <laughs> wonderful and maybe we can all share our merits the good old traditional Bhante, Bhante Vimalaramsi style. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the <laughs> shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, you take care, everybody. Beautiful smiles. Keep it going. <laughs>